Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to welcome all of you, both those who are here in person, as well as the many folks who are joining us online. Uh, so this is the final presentation in this season's NHGRI DIR seminar series, and it's a real pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Elaine Ostrander. Dr. Ostrander is an NIH Distinguished Senior Investigator and Chief of the Cancer Genetics and Comparative Genomics Section of the National Human Research Genome Research Institute at NIH. Dr. Ostrander received her bachelor's degree from the University of Washington in Seattle. She then went on to earn her PhD in microbiology and immunology from the Oregon Health and Sciences University. She completed her postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard University and at the University of California at Berkeley. She then moved to the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, where with collaborators, she launched the K9 Genome Project and built the first K9 linkage and radiation hybrid maps, which represented the foundational resources needed to navigate the K9 genome. In 1993, Dr. Ostrander joined the faculty of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and University of Washington. There, she continued her work in the K9 genome and also expanded her research portfolio to build two highly successful programs to search for genetic risk factors that predispose to human breast cancer and human prostate cancer. Through those studies, she identified more than 30 risk alleles for human prostate cancer, and she made the seminal discovery that young women with a germline mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 have a greatly increased risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer. Dr. Ostrander quickly rose through the ranks at the Hutch to become a member in the Human Biology and Clinical Research Divisions and head of the genetics program there. In 2004, she joined the National Human Genome Research Institute here at NIH, where she currently serves as an NIH Distinguished Senior Investigator and Chief of the Cancer Genetics and Comparative Genomics Branch. Dr. Ostrander has published over 300 peer-reviewed publications, including multiple seminal publications in Cell, Science, Nature, and the New England Journal of Medicine. She also wrote the white paper arguing for the genome sequencing of the domestic dog. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. She has also won numerous awards in recognition of her scientific and mentoring achievements, including the American Cl Kennel Club Asa Mays Award for Excellence in Canine Health Research, the Lifetime Achievement a winner of the International, uh, International Canine Health Award, the Burroughs Welcome Fund Innovation Award in Functional Genomics, the Lifetime Achievement Award from Weill Cornell Medical College's Prostate Cancer Institute, the Genetic Society of America Medal for her research into the genetic basis of phenotypic variation between dog breeds and on genome-wide association studies in human cancers, the Edward Novitsky Prize for Extraordinary Creativity and Intellectual Ingenuity in Genetics Research, the NHGRI Mentor of the Year Award, and the NIH Oxford Cambridge Scholars Mentorship Award. She's also received an honorary doctorate from the Universities of Utrecht in the Netherlands and Rennes in France. So the title of Dr. Ostrander's presentation today is Legacy of the Domestic Dog, Informing a Biological Discovery Through Large-Scale Genomics. Uh, so please join me in uh, welcoming her to the podium. Elaine. All right, thank you um, all for coming, and thank you uh, to everybody online um, for participating as well. I especially want to thank um, my amazingly talented graduate students, postdocs, technicians, research fellows, whose work I'm really privileged um, to, to summarize today. Um, it's always a privilege to, to have a chance to talk about, you know, really exciting and, and some of this very, very new data. Okay, so. First, I just want to address the general question of why do you study dogs? So they're particularly amenable to genetic studies because they are large numbers. There are about 90 million dogs owned in the United States. They live in the same environment as we do. They have the same um, exposures. They get the same diseases as humans do, and they receive extensive preventative and diagnostic health care. So in 2022 alone, Americans spent $137 billion on their pets, and about half of that was on health care. So medicines, vet visits, insurance. 
Um, sampling is much easier in dogs than in humans um, because we can sample multiple generations um, due to the comparatively shorter lifespan. Um, and of great interest here at NIH is that um, studies of dogs inform studies of human health and biology. And that's certainly an important focus for what we do. Now, my lab has lots of, of fun projects going on, and obviously I can't talk about all these today. I'm going to do a little bit of a smorgasbord and, and talk about four or so of those projects. Um, I want to set the stage by talking about breed organization. We'll talk about morphology and body size, as well as some other um, traits. Um, we're going to talk about dog lineages um, and how that's really opened up studies for the genetics of behavior. And finally, um, I'll talk about some work using a genotype-first approach to identify candidate variants associated with particular traits. Thank you. All right, so dogs were domesticated 20 to 30,000 years ago, likely in northern Eurasia. And that's just an evolutionary drop in the bucket, if you think about the big picture. Um, we started seeing dogs with jobs, herding dogs, sled dogs, draft dogs about 10,000 years ago. But dog breeding kind of became you know, an issue. It really began in earnest about 5,000 years ago as we increasingly depended on them for our own survival. What you may not know, though, is that most modern breeds have only been around for about 200 years. Most breeds you see running around at the dog park were developed during Victorian times by fanciers in Western Europe, and again, have you know, so much less than a drop in the bucket, making them a wonderful resource uh, for understanding the genetics of so many traits. Um, the modern dog displays a diversity of morphological, behavioral, and disease susceptibilities. Um, and there's some nice examples, I think, here on this slide. Um, dogs are arguably the most morphologically diverse land mammal on Earth, although there's some people that argue the rabbit is, is more diverse. I don't agree with them. All dogs are members of the same species, Canis lupus familiaris. And registering bodies recognize about 350 distinct breeds. And there are many other sort of niche populations throughout the world. Um, they get the same diseases as we do, as I mentioned on the previous slide, and there's a nice example there um, of melanoma in humans and dogs. Now, my lab doesn't keep any dogs. We don't breed any dogs. We don't kennel any dogs. We don't advise people on how to breed dogs. But we are in this long-term partnership with owners, breeders, veterinarians. It's a big citizen science project. It goes on throughout the world. Um, and because of that, we've been fortunate to amass a data set of about 35,000 dog DNA samples in our freezer, most of which we're, we're happy to share with colleagues and collaborators. Now, I've shown this, I think, in every seminar I've given, and that's because it's so foundational to everything we do. So this is work Heidi Parker started um, in about 2004, and she's made multiple iterations of this neighbor joining dendrogram, the neighbor joining tree, in the intervening years. This particular one has 167 breeds. Um, it's based on 170,000 positions in the genome, so ascertained using a, a SNP chip. And what she's done is collect 10 dogs of each of these 161 breeds, um, and then when she analyzes the data, data and asks how do breeds relate one to another, we really get this, this beautiful, beautiful um, portrayal of those relationships. Um, so there are 23 individual clades. She actually now has a data set of over 300 breeds. And, and you'll recognize some of these, right? So the bully dogs, the Boston Terrier, the French Bulldog, the Bull Terrier, the Miniature Bull Terrier over here. Um, we have the Spaniels and Retrievers over here in red. We have the ter Terriers um, up here in aqua. So um, there's always surprises when we add new breeds. But by and large, um, this makes really good sense. Now, I put this up in every seminar because we go back to it over and over as we develop hypotheses. And so I often use this example that if a dog walks into your office and it has some complex disorder like diabetes, well, you can use not only DNA from that French bulldog who came into your office, but all of these other bully breeds because they shared a very recent common ancestor. Remember that 200 years that we talked about just a moment ago. 
And we could do the same thing. If a Norwich Terrier comes into our office, we could combine data from the Silky Terrier, the Yorkshire Terrier, the Norfolk Terrier, the Cairn Terrier. Um, and again, they share a recent common ancestor. Now what we find up here is almost certainly gonna be different than what we find down here. Um, but that is one of the big advantages of dogs because it's a way to get around those locus heterogeneity problems that are so difficult to overcome in human genetics. Now, when Joss Plissé joined my lab, he took on the identification of many different morphological traits, but he was really most interested in body size. And he has identified a large number, well, actually a small number of genes, there's probably about 20, that account for um, about 90% of the size variation when you think about small to medium-sized breeds. That's a really tiny number of genes. Um, when we look at similar studies in human genetics, there are thousands of GWAS loci that account for variation in human height and human weight. So a reoccurring theme that you'll hear today for lots of traits we talk about is small numbers of loci of large effect in dogs, large numbers of loci of small effect when we think about humans. And that offers us just tremendous advantages in dealing with sample size um, and dealing with the underlying statistics. So recently, um, Heidi undertook a new series of experiments. And what she wanted to do was to take some of these complex morphological traits and break them down into really small component parts and see if we could identify the genetics underlying those. And I'm gonna give you some examples here. What you're looking at here is a consensus of 100 trees that were built from random pulls of 10% of the data. Now the idea here is that we're gonna look within a clade, but we're gonna pick clades where there are extremes of whatever trait we're particularly interested in, and that's how we're gonna focus our, our genome-wide studies. Um, indicated for you are um, a number of the clades that she's been interested in. These are the six that she's been particularly focused on, and I'll show you data um, from the first four of those today. So the first thing we tackled, as we've often tackled in my lab, is body size. But now she focused on the two clades that have the very largest breeds. So one of the flock guardians and sighthounds, they make up a single clade. And she looked at 48 breeds and 234 individual dogs. And then there's the mastiff clade, which just sounds big. And she looked at 25 breeds um, and uh, 169 dogs. So the first thing uh, we looked at was the distribution of height and weight and body mass index. Now, if you look at the graph, in aqua, we have the flock guardians and sighthounds. In blue, we have the mastiffs. When we look at weight, they're pretty much identical. When we look at height, we see the flock guardians and sighthounds um, excel. And when we look at BMI, then it's the mastiffs that stand out. So clearly, they're growing in much different ways, even though they're just all really big dogs. And so rather than lump these together, as we've done in the past, we really have to split them up and consider these traits as individual phenotypes. Now, the next slide takes a moment to come up, but yay, it came up. So this is an association study with breed standard weight. And what's striking about this is the upper GWAS is the mastiff clade, and the lower is the flock guardian and the sighthound clade and they don't look very similar. So these are you know, big bulky dogs, but yet the key loci are very different for these clades. Now we know some of these genes, LCORL is an old favorite, it's been shown in at least a dozen species to be important in body size. And down here in the flock guardian and the sighthound clade, IGSF1, ACSL4, these are on the X chromosome, and again, these are things um, that Joss has seen before. But we see some new things as well. So one of the most interesting, um, shown on canine chromosome 32 in the mastiff clade, is PRKG2. The next slide may take a moment to come up. Um, so this is a cyclic GMP-dependent type 2 protein kinase that regulates bone growth. It causes dwarfism in lots of species, in cattle and rats, and in this particular dog breed, the Dogo Argentino. In humans, it's associated with height, with hip and waist circumference. And when we see mutations, um, we see a, a form of dysplasia of short limbs and fingers, um, disproportionately large head, and a depressed nasal bridge. So we have other body size loci. We're in the process of investigating and opening up sort of new avenues for thinking about things that control body size, body weight, and, and BMI, skeletal size, body weight, and BMI. 
But we wanted to look at other traits that are important in these breeds. And so one of the things that she picked was brachycephaly. So that's that sort of pushed in face that you see in bulldogs, um, for instance. So we've done general scans for brachycephaly before. Those were led by Jeff Schoenbeck when he was a postdoc in my lab. But now we broke it down. We looked at muzzle length and we looked at underbite. So she divided dogs. There are things like the Cane Corso, where the muzzle length is less than one third of the total head length, versus the Dog de Bordeaux, where it's one fifth. And when we do that analysis, we get this great signal to noise ratio right up here. And this is just showing you how different the one-third and the one-fifth look. And so we see an old friend when we look at the underlying gene. It's, it's bone morphogenesis protein 3. Um, we've seen it before. Jeff mapped it several years ago. But now we know the part of brachycephaly that it's responsible for. And this is an inhibitor of osteogenic bone morphogenic proteins. We also looked at bite. So you can see the French bulldog has this pronounced underbite. The Staffordshire Bull Terrier has the classic scissor bite, but you can see the canine teeth are, are over on the lips. And again, we can look at that part of the phenotype and identify as one of the important loci SMOC2. Jeff has since gone, he uh, has his own lab, and SMOC2 was identified by his lab a few years ago. It makes perfect sense, it's an inhibitor of mineralization. So we're, we're chomping down on each one of these. Now, I should say there's a, a muzzle length and there's a body size locus on canine chromosome 32. And I wanted to be clear that they're not the same locus. So PRKG2 and BMP3, we'll go back if we can. We may not be able to. Um, and this is Mastiff relative weight association. This is Mastiff relative muzzle length association. Um, and, and you can see that although they're in the same chromosome, the same general area. Obviously, they're at different positions. So they, they kind of tend to go together in these big breeds, um, but they're, they're not the same locus. All right, let's switch to another clade. Let's, let's go ahead and look at the pointer clade. So I really like pointers, um, but one of the things about them is all the different breeds kind of look the same. Uh, the pointer clade includes not just pointers, but it also includes uh, the setters. And so we wanted to look at one really specific trait, and that is the type of nasal bridge shape, all right? So there are three kinds of nasal bridge if you, if you look at the blue lines. You can have a straight bridge, like the Wiesla and the small Munsterlander. You can have a convex uh, bridge, like the Broca Italiano, the German, short, German short-haired pointer, or this Pont Adumur. Um, or it can be convex, like the English pointer, um, or what you're seeing here in the Portuguese water dog. So really similar, but these are part of the breed standard. So these are things breeders have been selecting for um, over you know, the last couple hundred years. We got a great signal on Zeb B2. So what's Zeb B2? Well, in humans, my colleagues who, who study rare diseases may know that's associated with Mowat Wilson syndrome. And among the many traits in that syndrome are very distinctive facial features. So there's a low hanging columella and an arched bridge. So the tip of the nose actually hangs lower than the nostrils and it curves downward to the lips. And that's thought to be because they have an overly long septum. So it's a tiny aspect of the overall face, but because of how breeds are structured, to be a member of a breed, your parents had to be, your grandparents had to be, da 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 da, and because of the strong selection imposed by humans, we can map these really very nuanced traits. The last one I'll show you is ear set. Um, so this is again in the pointers, um, and all pointers um, have floppy ears. That's something Edward Cadu identified when he was uh, MSRB3 when he was a graduate student in the lab. Um, but the ear set is different. So in things like the English setter or the Broca Italiano, it's actually further down and more forward, whereas in the German wire-haired pointer and the Brittany Spaniel, it's at the top of their head. So down versus up. And so you might have thought that's just too subtle, but again, these qualities are part of the breed standard. And so we get a really strong signal. This is in FLIRT T2, which controls cartilage differentiation. So this is the cartilage that builds versus that which attaches to the bone. We don't have the mutation there yet. That's something we're looking forward to working on. 
Um, and, and Heidi's looked at, she's kind of gone wild looking at all kinds of traits, whether it's lips um, or tail or muzzle um, or leg length. You know, the American Kennel Club has 22 different tail shapes associated with breeds. So 22 different tails, whether they're curved or straight or arched, et cetera, that are associated with different breed types. In this particular analysis, Heidi was looking at straight with a little bit of a tip curved up at the end um, versus this corkscrew with one turn, not two turns. Those are different. Um, and lots of interesting loci to follow up on, but the one that jumped out at us was EPO8, which is associated with scoliosis it's, and other connective tissue disorders. Um, and you, again, my, my colleagues in the rare disease field will recognize VIS syndrome and Loewy's Dietz. So um, really interesting system um, in which to explore those. Now with morphology streaming along really nicely in the lab, um, I want to turn my attention a little bit to behavior. So um, when we, we know that at, at a point in time, 5,000 or so years ago, humans became so important for our survival. And there were herding dogs and sled dogs and hunting dogs and draft dogs, all things that we needed um, in order to survive and grow and migrate as people. So when Emily Dutro um, joined the lab, she wanted to investigate um, the genetic basis of these traits further. So she built a data set of 3,864 modern canine genomes. She had whole genome sequence on about 1,200 of them, and she had SNP array data at 170,000 positions on the other 3,100. And they included not just breed dogs, but also some mixed breed dogs, some wild canids, and village or semi-feral dogs. So these are dogs that are not under selection um, for anything. And this is a great way to capture the maximum amount of diversity um, that exists in the species. So she took that data and she analyzed it using a program called FATE. So FATE was originally developed for looking at single cell data, and Emily was the first person to uh, apply it to these kinds of population studies. So FATE is, is very cool because unlike phylogenetic data, you can have unlimited neighbors. So you, it supports all possible data structures, whether they're bifurcating or clusters or linear. Um, so this is really a great way to, to look at different canine breeds. So when she did this, she found um, that there were 10 different lineages um, in, in her data set. And you know, some of these you'll recognize the terriers or the pointers. They don't divide up the way the AKC does. These are dividing up by lineage. And within any one of these lines, like the terriers, there's obviously gonna be a progression of different breeds until we get to the end, which are gonna be the most differentiated dogs. So those are the highest selection, the ones where the traits, uh, the genes underlying, the variants underlying traits are most likely to be fixed. So she overlaid that with behavioral data from the CBARC questionnaire, which is a very well-validated tool that's been around in our field since uh, 2003. This was developed by Jim Serple, and it's an online survey data. And currently, the database has information, 100 questions for 67,000 dogs. So it's a very rich database. And she overlaid that CBARC data on the FATE embedding genetic data. And then she had a lot of choices of what she wanted to study, and she decided to study the herder lineage. Now, it's called the herder lineage. It probably should have been called livestock management uh, lineage. Um, but it includes lots of different types of breeds. Herders, healers, those are the dogs that bite at the heels of the livestock to get them to move. Drovers, boundary dogs, as well as guardians. So the herders are the ones here in blue, and, and they are the most differentiated, or the ones that have been under the best selection or most selection, and those are the ones that she focused on. So she did an awful lot of work. You can read about it in her cell paper. I'm not gonna go through all of it. Um, but the, the punchline is here on this slide. What she saw was, when she did an enrichment analysis, um, what came up over and over were axon guidance genes, those that acted early in brain development, and they were strongly associated with that herder lineage. So anywhere, so this is the keg output, and any of these in green um, are genes that showed up in her analysis. And they included genes important in axon outgrowth, in axon attraction, um, and in axon regulation. Um, and, and so this was really very exciting, and, and it was really very cool. Um, and we have certainly a lot of work to do. 
But we've spent some time speculating because for a long time I've wanted to understand the genetics of herding dogs. So many of the genes that came up were part of the efferent signaling pathway. So we took some time to think about how could efferent 5 contribute to herding, efferent 5 being one of those that have come up very strongly subsequently in other people's studies. Well, efferent 5 and its ligand have been implicated in anxiety and maternal pup gathering in, in mouse models. So, you know, getting the mother, getting the pups together, keeping them contained, keeping them close to her. Um, but when the gene is, is mutated or knocked out, that behavior is gone. So our hypothesis, um, total speculation with no data, um, is that herding drive could involve augmentation of those same anxiety-associated pathways that drive maternal protective behaviors. So if you've ever had a chance to watch a border collie herd, you see that anxiety, you see that jitteriness, you see that urge to collect and contain as well as to move the herd in the direction um, that they've been instructed to. So I'm really excited about our future studies uh, in this direction. Now, I'd be remiss uh, at the same time I didn't tell you about Jamin Kim's data. Um, Jamin also now has his own lab. But when he was in the lab, he got really interested in athletic behaviors. It was actually an Olympic year, um, and we were all just interested in what makes a good athlete. So he sequenced two breed groups that had very different approaches to hunting and athletic behavior. The sport hunting breeds, they're bred to assist hunters by retrieving, flushing, pointing, and it requires prolonged periods of physical activity, a lot of endurance. And then there's the, the terriers, and they're employed basically to get rid of vermin. Whether it's in a building, whether it's in land, they're still employed in that capacity. And it requires very short, rapid bursts of activity. So we wanted to see how the underlying genetics differed. And maybe expectedly, we came up with three classes of genes, those important um, in neurological function, so things that affected learning, um, things that when knocked out are associated with mental disability, lots of things associated with muscle, muscle contraction, muscle development, um, fatigue enhanced muscle pain, muscle mass, and of course, cardiovascular, heart, hypertension, heart rate and hypertension, and vascular smooth muscle contraction. So we kind of got interested in this because there are examples of behaviors that can only be executed in the background of specific morphological traits. And so we wanted to see what would come up when we did this comparison. And, and what came up were basically things that span that whole space, neurological things to, to morphological things to functional things. I'm just going to tell you about um, two of these, um, myostatin and TRPM3. So the relevant myostatin mutation was um, shown a few years ago um, by Dana Mosier in, in our lab, and it's a knockout of the myostatin gene. Now, if you have the right myostatin mutation and the right TRPM, uh, TRPM3 mutation, and you're a whippet, you will run 27% faster than all the whippets that don't have the right combination. Two alleles, that's just extraordinary. And again, it speaks to the structure of different breeds. Um, the myostatin is interesting. That's responsible for musculature. Um, the dog in the middle is a heterozygote for the myostatin knockout. And it doesn't look like your typical anorexic whippet. It, it actually looks, you can see the musculature is well developed. And the dog at the bottom is a homozygote for the myostatin knockout. And you can see it's more overly or heavily muscled. Um, and these are not bred, either of these, purposely um, by the, the breed clubs because they're not the, the desired appearance. But we just thought this was just you know, so incredibly cool. And it was an Olympic year, and so I got calls from lots of media asking me if humans who were heterozygotes for a myostatin mutation, first how many were, and, and should, they, should they participate in the Olympics separately? So should there be sprinters who had the mutation and sprinters who didn't have the mutation? And we had to explain this is just a couple of what are going to be, you know, hundreds of uh, performance enhancing polymorphisms, as I like to call them, and, and the media picked up on. OK, another one that's kind of fun to think about is Robo-1, which affects learning. So here, um, the important um, trait we looked at was agility. So think American Ninja Warrior. So you have to go over, you have to go under, you have to jump, you, you need balance, all those sorts of things. Um, they have to get through these obstacle courses. And so Dana Drager is uh, a national champion with her dogs and agility. She certainly contributed a lot to, to this um, study. And we learned a lot about agility from her. 
So we were able to measure breed-specific athletic ability in the context of agility. And Robo-1 variants were significantly associated even after we corrected um, for morphological traits. So Robo-1 plays a role in the regulation of um, neuronal migration and development and axon guidance and growth. In humans, it's associated with developmental dyslexia. So what you see in humans is a learning ability that's associated with translating visual cues. So in dogs, it seems to affect their ability to learn and to identify environmental information in places like an obstacle course. So dogs will run an obstacle course multiple times and, and they'll be timed as to how fast they go through it. And so they obviously learn or they pick up visual cues. If you see a teeter-totter, you have to go up, but you have to expect that it's then going to go down. Or if you, if you see these uh, pegs, you know you have to go left, right, left, right, left. And that ability uh, is compromised in, in dogs that have the mutation. So we've looked at a, a number of these, and we're delighted to still be collaborating um, with Jamin Kim on these studies. But um, lots of these turn out um, to, to be really very interesting. OK, so um, with behavior work um, ongoing, and I should say, because I forgot to before, when I was talking about border collies, is there are a number of traits in border collies, some good, some anomalous. Um, and Dana has a very large study that she's in the process of executing to follow up on those um, and find the genetics underlying those traits. If you're a border collie owner, you have probably heard from her at some point in time. Okay, so with behavior well in hand, I want to talk about the work that Reuben Buckley has been doing. Um, and he talked about this uh, early studies um, in the fall. Um, but he's made quite a bit of progress, um, and he's just done some very cool things. And so I, I thought I would visit this topic again. So Ruben has been looking at what he would call a genotype-first approach. So the idea is you, you have genome sequence, you identify variants using very rigorous criteria, and then you try and match them up with the, what the trait is going to be um, based on knowledge about the breed and breed traits and, and all that. So you do this by prioritizing variants based on constraint metrics and then determine the trait the variant is likely associated with. Now, this can be hard to do, and it's easy to do it poorly. You need to have a dense set of well-sequenced genomes. Ours were, in general, 20x. And they need to be aligned to a very high quality reference. So for several years, our community used the Boxer um, reference genome sequence. Um, and the group at the Broad did uh, ever wonderful um, improvements and iterations of that. Um, but recently, the Broad released a fantastic high quality sequence of the German Shepherd Dog. And so everyone in our community is now focused on using the German Shepherd Dog as our reference sequence. So the data has to have a large number of breeds. That's the only way you're going to capture all the variation you want. And we had to have at least three dogs per breed. And we included mixes. And again, we included village dogs, those dogs that are not under selection. And the idea is you want to capture the maximal amount of variation in the species that you possibly can. Now, this study relied um, somewhat on the Dog 10K project, which I don't know that I've had much chance to, to talk about. So Dog 10K was um, started a few years ago by myself, by uh, Gu Dong Wang, and by Bob Wayne at UCLA. Unfortunately, Bob died about 18 months ago, so he didn't live to see the end of this project. Um, but I know he would really be proud uh, of how, uh, how much progress we've made. So we eventually want to uh, sequence and analyze genomes from 10,000 canids. Last year, we published a paper with the first 2,000 canids um, analyzed in really just excruciating detail. And crossing the finish line was left, led by Jeff Kidd um, at uh, University of Michigan. So 194 of the breeds that we sequenced and analyzed were actually unique to this panel, so lots of new data. We initially generated data from 2,075 samples. Um, but you know, once we put them through various filters, and we also thought about some dogs we would keep in or leave out, depending on whether we were studying demography or genome architecture um, or function or looking for structural variations, um, the numbers varied um, somewhat, but, but basically stayed around um, 1,900. 
All the samples were sequenced in the same way, and they were processed in a harmonized fashion to reduce batch effects. And that was really one of the hardest parts of the project, because we're all doing sequencing, sequencing and we all just want to pile everything on to get the best numbers. But we knew that wasn't the right way to do it. Um, to add functional prioritization, single cell variants were annotated using SNPF and Zoonomia phylopea scores. And I'll tell you about Zoonomia in just a moment. Reference genome was the German Shepherd dog, but it turns out that dog is a female. So we um, supplanted our data with three Y contigs, and those were from Jeff Schonenbach's lab um, and the Labrador Retriever. Um, imputation is a big deal in our community because not everybody has the money to do deep sequencing. And so we wanted to make sure imputation worked really well. So the utility of our data as an imputation reference panel was assessed. And we generated very high confidence calls across uh, varied genotyping platforms. And so that was really uh, terrific. All in all, 44,000 structu uh, structural variants, indels, insertions, duplications, inversions that were um, 50 base pair or greater in size, um, 14 million indels, and 34 million single nucleotide variants. And this data was so, so, so well curated. Um, by Jeff's lab and by Jennifer Meadows' group at Uppsala. And it's the most extensive canine variant catalog that's been produced to date. And of course, it's immediately, even before you publish it, it's out of date. Um, and so, you know, many more hundreds of sequences have been added since. It was rewarding at the recent uh, canine and feline genetics and genomics meeting in Finland to hear so many people get up and say that they were using this as a reference, that they were relying on it for their analyses. Um, and so it's always great here at NHGRI to generate data and distribute it and see everybody um, in your community um, is making use of it. I do want to make the point that good depth does not guarantee a high proportion of the genome is covered. So in, in Ruben's project, he added a number of sequences from our own NHGRI dog genome project. And if you look at dog 10K, you'll see there's more dogs um, that are covered at 15X or better than in the NHGRI dog genome project, but there's also more um, for which portions of the genome are not well covered. So we combined these, we ended up uh, with about 2,300 dogs. So what variants did we look at? Well, Ruben prioritized them by mutation type, breed specificity, allele frequency, and gene importance. So evolutionary conservation is the name of the game here. We want things that are intolerant to mutations. So we relied on zoonomia. So zoonomia is an effort that's been led by Shostin Lynn Blateau at the Broad. And they've sequenced 240 mammalian species that span 100 million years. So this is just an amazing data set, an amazing resource, really for everyone in the field, the greater field of mammalian genomics. So we wanted to, to maximize for variants that were likely to be of functional relevance, but you know, in positions that were under strong constraint. So we made use of OMIA, which is the animal variation of OMIM, online Mendelian inheritance in animals. And we used this catalog to tune the constraint parameters. We focused on 31 loss of function OMIA variants that segregated specifically within our data set. And we used the Phyla P scores to assess constraint. So if you haven't worked with um, Phyla P, it measures evolutionary conservation at individual alignment sites compared to that which is expected under, under neutral drift. Um, and it turns out that using a minimum Phyla P score of 2.75 um, was the perfect space to be in. So we were able to get a maximum of OMIA variants, but things that were under strong constraint. And of course, the OMIA variants are here in pink, and all loss of function uh, variants are, are, um, are here in, in red. Um, and so we ended up with a, with a pretty good, pretty tight data set. Now, one of the things I was worried about was, you know, was this really going to work? Were these really going to be things that we found in a, in a small number of breeds? And it turns out they, they were. So, mm -hmm. all right. So what you're looking at here are missense and loss of function alleles in OMIA. So let's look at the loss of function ones on the right. So um, Ruben was trying to figure out what the best allele frequency cutoff was. So what we're doing is we're searching for rare variants 
that are in a small number of breeds. But in those breeds, they occur with a pretty high frequency. So if you look on the, on the Y, you see variants N. So there are probably 12 variants. And if you look over here at the allele frequency cutoff of 0.2, there's about 12 variants that only occur as indicated by the purple in one breed. Now, not all 12 are in the same breed. There's 12, and they're probably going to be in you know, 12 different breeds. Um, but that's telling us that those are things that are going to be really important for one or another trait um, in those breeds. So um, here what we've done is, or Ruben's done is he's ranked candidate trait variants by breed enrichment. So what you want are things where the carrier frequency of the alternative allele is high, and the alternative allele is rarely seen in other breeds. And again, we're looking at missense, and we're looking at loss of function variants. In purple, we're looking at the carrier frequency in breeds with the alternative allele. And so we're looking for things that are dark purple. Those are things here at the top. Um, and in blue, we're looking at the alternative allele distribution. So breed allele count over total allele count. And it's those things in dark blue that we're really um, particularly interested in. Um, and, and here are some of the top impacted genes. And this was so exciting to get to this part. We recognized many of these. So the, the very top one, SGK3 is responsible for hairlessness in the American Hairless Terrier. These dogs are completely and totally bald. So not surprising, it's under really strong selection because having no fur is part of the definition of the breed. But it's the second one, PDG-FRA, that I want to tell you just a little bit more about because it's responsible for this bifid or split nose phenotype um, in the tidal burrow. So this ranked very high by all of our criteria. Um, and, the, and the phenotype occurs pretty much in that breed and one other I'll say uh, more about in just a moment. And it's very dramatic. And there's a, a higher incidence of cleft palate um, in dogs that, that have this trait. So it's rare. It's restricted to just a couple of regions. The chattel burn is not formally recognized by any breed club. Um, the second breed where we see this trait is the Pashan Navarro, and that's the second dog shown for you here. And that is recognized uh, by the registering body in Spain. I will say that bifid nose is not completely fixed, um, but we really see it very, very, very rarely um, elsewhere in dogs. As I said, there's an increased incidence of cleft palate. And you know what's interesting? The Chattel Burn and the Pashan Navarro actually look very similar. And so... Um, you know, we dug through history a lot, and there is a historical connection between the breeds. Both the Spanish Peninsula and Eastern Turkey were conquered in that time between 630 and 720. So our, our likeliest explanation is that conquerors brought dogs from Iran, from Iraq, from Syria, north to Turkey, and then west to Spain. And that's why we see those two breeds there. Now, Probably my favorite thing to show in this talk is this panel over here on the right. Um, shown at the top is a, a palace. This is a pas palace of Bertamati. It's in Andalusia, Spain. And look down here, and I think you can see it pretty well. So this palace was constructed in the 1800s. And you can see when you look at the gargoyles, one of them is a dog that absolutely has that split nose phenotype. So something that's been around and observed in Spain for some time. I will say um, Heidi went digging through the art, <laughs> through art in the Renaissance, and she found a picture of Diana going off to the hunt. Um, and it has a picture of all the dogs that are in there. Um, uh, it has one dog that also has uh, the split nose. And this is something that was painted um, in the late Renaissance. So 1500s or so, these are things that have been around for a while. We do not have a sample from the Pashan Navarro. We have tried every which possible way we can. We only need one sample. You don't see this dog in the United States. It's pretty much just in Spain. And we have not yet been able to get a single sample. So we're optimistic, we're hopeful, but we're not quite there. Um, the Chattel Burn dogs have a splice acceptor mutation in the seventh intron. Um, so this is in the immunoglobulin-like um, part. We've tested 17 dogs. Uh, most of these samples were provided by Nukit Bilgen from the University of Ankara, and they're all heterozygous. So we think this is probably homozygous lethal. Uh, Moss mouse knockout shows that PDG FRA is critical for medial nasal process development, and you can see that um, in this nice figure 
uh, that came from Phil Soriano's lab in 2013. So PDGF, PDGFRA regulates multipotent um, cell differentiation towards chondrocytes. And it does that by inhibiting WIT9A beta-catenin pathway during chondrocranial cartilage development. Now, I found two pedigrees. Ruben found one. I found one um, in the literature of humans um, that segregate likely functional missense mutations. Um, those that carry the mutation have not just cleft lip, but they also have cleft palate. So in this pedigree, everyone who is starred has the mutation. Everyone colored in black has cleft lip and palate. So everyone colored in black has a mutation. There are two individuals who have the mutation but are not reported to have the cleft lip and palate phenotype. Now, um, after this, we put out a call, um, a big call, Ruben did all over the world, to try and recruit additional dogs with the split nose phenotype. Um, and here are six um, that we've gotten in. Um, I think with one exception, these are all mixes, and you can see they all look um, very different. Um, let me preempt one question and tell you that the second one here is not a pig, it's actually a dog, because I get asked that every time I give a seminar. Um, so one of these dogs, the golden retriever mix, um, had a mutation in the same gene in the protein kinase domain. Um, it was also a splice acceptor. Um, for three of these, there's really strong mouse experimental validation. Um, and all of these um, are associated with craniofacial abnormalities, cleft palate, cleft in the upper lip, um, and, and so the three additional genes, in addition to PDGFRA, are things that we want to look at in other dogs that have cleft palate or cleft lip and palate. So cleft lip and palate is not actually that rare in dogs per se. Um, and it comes up, and sometimes it, it comes up in, in a family. And so we really want to look at these variants and see if they're relevant um, in any of those. And of course, we'd love to get a Pashan to borrow dog for, for our work. So I've, I've taken you through a long sort of roundabout journey, and I, I promised you a smorgasbord, and I think I've, I've done that. Um, what I've tried to communicate is that early dogs, driven, they were driven by human needs, and we still rely on our dogs. Less for occupation, right, and, and more um, for our emotional needs, family needs, um, guidance dogs, still the hunting and the herding dogs uh, turn out to be very, very important um, for, for many individuals. Most modern breeds were developed during Victorian times, and as we look at those haplotypes, we see very characteristic haplotypes. Evolutionary constraint and, cons and comparative genomics is deepening our understanding of canine traits uh, and disease. And dog breeds and knowledge about breed relationships serves as an important role in finding trait-associated genes. I didn't talk about um, very much about humans, um, but you know, another time we'll talk exclusively about disease with a real focus on cancer, where things that we're finding in, in dogs um, turn out to be relevant important, and important in human cancers as well. Our reoccurring theme and the reason that we stick with dogs um, is a small number of genes of large effect that control many complex traits in dogs. And as I just said, many of these genes uh, play key roles in human pathologies. And I, I just mentioned a, a few of what we found. There are lots of resources if you want to come over to our side and start studying dogs instead of mice and flies and worms and all those sorts of things. There are other things coming. A canine brain atlas um, is on the way. Um, this is single cell coding and non-coding annotation of brain. This has been done in, in beagles. Um, and there's dog A, which is single cell coding and non-coding um, variants in 14 different organ systems. Um, being here at NHGRI, we've made a data, our data available prior to publication. Um, and we just uh, like to put this QR code up in case anybody wants to come by and, and snap it. So these are probably not all of my collaborators, but I think they're primarily the, the people that I talked about today. Heidi, Emily, Rubin, Dana, and Alex are the people whose work I talked about today. The rest of the list includes people in the lab, both past and present, um, who I could have just as easily um, talked about their data today as well. I want to especially call out Jessica Hale and Andrew Hogan. 
They were both samples managers in the lab at different points in time, and they're responsible for getting many, 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 many of those samples on which all of these studies depended. And then, of course, we have lots of just wonderful, wonderful collaborators um, to whom we are extremely indebted. So I think right on time here, I've finished, and I'll go ahead and take questions. Thank you. You could ask me about your dog if you want. <laughs> All right, no questions. Oh, you had one. Sorry, I apologize. So, I, so, I, I mean, that. there's a, a million uh, dog questions I could ask, but maybe, I mean, we always think about this in terms of how are we impacting human medicine. But do you have any just anecdotal examples where it's gone the other way, where you've discovered that, you know, you could treat some dog disease or something based on medicine that we've developed for that same condition or, or that same gene in humans? Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's where we go to the cancers. And so we have a, a large project in the lab on um, uh, bladder cancer, invasive bladder cancer. And this is a big disease in a small number of breeds, Scotties, Westies, Shelties. And in Scotties, your risk of getting the disease, if you are a Scottie, is 22-fold higher than the average mixed breed dog walking down the street. So colleagues at Purdue um, have been using therapies developed for humans to treat Scotties. Because basically, if you have a Scottie that comes in with blood in the urine or is lame, they're going to you know, immediately test it for bladder cancer. I will say it's been met with as humans, you know, once it's metastasized, only partial success. I mean, dogs only live about a year after they have metastases. But certainly, in cases where it's not metastases, um, it has an effect and it can improve the, the length and the quality of the dog's life. And that's true in other cancers, the leukemias, the lymphomas. Um, there's a lot of work going on at NCI. Um, in, in um, neural, neuronal tumors. And so that's the space where I think there's been the most effect. And now we're hoping to go the other way. As we identify these susceptibility genes, um, we are, we're always talking about, well, can you know, targeted therapies be developed? What do these do in humans? And sometimes it's different. You know, there's a somatic mutation in bladder cancer that's in 85% of canine bladder tumors in BRAF, but human bladder tumors don't have a mutation in BRAF, but of course we know you do in colon cancers um, and, and in melanomas. So trying to figure out what's going on there is definitely part of the, the puzzle. Very cool, thank you. Sure, Julie? Um, very nice talk. So I'm coming back to one of the beginning things that you said about how the dogs have a small number of genes and a large effect size. And I'm still wondering, because that's then the data that you showed us, but is that because of the breeding structure that's happened over the last 500 years? Or is there something, like, it, it, it still doesn't quite add up right. to me. Great, that is the $64,000 question, right? Okay. And so that's what we debate the most often. So just to put it a, another way, for sure, breeding matters. So there's really strong selection. You only cross dog A to dog B if they have precisely the trait. And we work, pretty much only in purebred dogs. And to be honest, a lot of the dogs that we sample are show dogs. So they really have these traits in a very pristine way. But the question comes up, which is, is there something different about the canine genome that they sort of throw up these non-lethal alleles more frequently than you would expect um, by chance? So there are things for humans to select on as they go about um, deciding they want to make um, new breeds. And, and there's certainly a growing body of literature to suggest there is in terms of differences um, in DNA repair pathways being less effective in dogs than, than in humans. Um, I think as we investigate structural variants more, we'll, we'll learn a lot about that and about transposable elements. But that's another way people phrase the question is they say, well, if you took wolves now and you had 10,000 years, could you, in that amount of time, could you make you know, 350 dog breeds. Um, is everything we see today embedded in the wolf genome? Or are these variants that are, are being thrown up um, as time goes by? And, and I think by and large, as we're looking, um, it's a mix. Some of these are old variants. A variant in IGF-1 that makes dogs small has actually been found in wolves from 53,000 years ago in the heterozygote state. No idea why. 
Why would they need to keep that in their back pocket? But they do. Um, and other things we recognize as new mutations on old haplotypes. Yeah. So we have questions online from three uh, uh, attendees. Um, first is from um, Dr. Biesiger. Um He says, I assume that for the most part you can't do experimental manipulation with dogs. So can you talk about how you validate observational canine studies with experimental manipulations in other species? Yeah, we absolutely can't do experimentation in, in dogs. Although, you know, we can certainly collect tissues and, and you know, we can do things in, in individual tissues. Um, we certainly turned to mice. We um, tried zebrafish for some of our body size work, but there was too much variation in zebrafish um, just to start with. So we appreciated Sean's um, help there, but that didn't work out. Um, and I think, you know, like a lot of model organism species early on, we end up doing things in cell lines. But I will say, um, I've been talking increasingly to people who study things like aging, which are really interesting in a number of model systems like flies. Um, and in dogs, there's this weird conundrum that small dogs, small breeds live much longer than large breeds do. And so making that match, I think is gonna be really helpful and interesting for both model organism species. Yeah. Awesome, Elaine. Um, two questions. Following up on the SV stuff you alluded to in response to Julie, are we just not looking for SVs yet? Are there traits that you've struck out on on the GWAS style approaches that you think are lurking in SVs? Just oh, definitely. Just the state of the field? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so we are now looking, right? Dog10K gave us a robust enough data set to do that. And so there are people who are completely focused on that. We have found something. So squamous cell carcinoma, the digit in the poodle, um, that's a structural variant. And there have been you know, other things. It's, it's now starting to... Um, to come through the pipeline and we're starting to see those sorts of things. I think it's gonna be a big part of the story in dogs. Yeah. I really do. You know, it's just been too fast. The selection's been so strong. That's my guess. And then the second question, I've been looking at your tree of the breeds for years now and it never dawned on me to ask, like how representative is the tree structure there and do you see introgression between the different breeds and how often does that happen? Yeah, so um, I couldn't put it up because of space, but Heidi's most recent tree is 300 breeds. Um, and you know, you have to blow up whatever region it is you're particularly looking at. It's very representative. And I had a slide I took out in the interest of time that showed all the places in the world where we're currently collecting samples from um, in order to capture all these niche populations that maybe aren't recognized breeds, um, but have been selected for in this village for a particular trait. You know, we've done that in Chile, we've done that in, in Sicily, we've done that in a lot of places. We've so done once it in the breed is kind of fixed, there's not a lot of crossing in of other There's breeds. some early on. I mean, a lot of breeds were created by adding in some yeah. of this breed and some of that breed, getting something like this and strong selection. Yeah, and if Dana were here, she would, she would talk for a long time about the popular breeding strategies that people use to rapidly um, fix particular traits. But, uh, you know, breeders don't cross to other breeds because yeah. there's this concept that if, you know, I have a female Boston Terrier and I cross it to something else, then my dog will no longer be favored in the ring because yeah. that was a bad thing to do. So in modern times, no, very little. But as we go back and look, and we've been collecting samples from the 1800s, um, for sure that's what we're seeing. Right. Thank you. Um, so another question online from Emmy Rosenberg. Uh, the question is, um, does checkpoint inhibition apply, apply to dogs? Do you need species-specific species monoclonal antibodies, or can you use humans? I don't know the answer to that, because I haven't done it. But I'm guessing, based on the sequence similarity, that human will probably work just fine. But that's a guess. Uh, and then last online question from Nancy Emmaker. Are you still looking for Westy participants to donate blood samples? Um, we're looking for West Highland White Terriers that have bladder cancer, for sure. Um, so the things we're pretty focused on are Scotties, Westies, and Shelties with um, invasive bladder cancer, and histiocytic sarcoma in Bernie's Mountain Dogs and in flat-coated retrievers. And if you do own one of those breeds, I will tell you that 20 in flat-coated retrievers, 25% in the Bernie's Mountain Dogs will go on to get histiocytic sarcoma, and all who get it will die of the disease. So that is a huge priority um, in the canine genome. And we recently published the first locus um, in the flat-coated retriever. But lots and lots and lots of work to do there. So if you have affected dogs, for sure we're interested. 
Okay. Yeah, I, it is on. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, so in human GWAS studies, you hear so much about the dangers of population stratification. Yeah. And your work obviously is going to be susceptible to that. Um, yeah. And is that why Heidi did her thing within a small clade? Uh, for morphological I mean, differences. Actually, we've done it in, in lots of different ways. So we, we certainly correct for population stratification. We, uh, you know, in dogs, it's not the number of samples, it's the number of lineages. And so we would never in a GWAS put um, dogs that shared, that were from the same family, shared common parents, shared common um, grandparents. You know, we mm -hmm. go back as far as we can. And for some small breeds, we, we could actually capture all the lineages in that breed mm -hmm. for exactly that reason. Um, you know, there are some things that where, where we can consider all these breeds as a whole, but then you, we really have to include all these niche populations from all over the world. But when we're looking at individual breeds, it's always something that we have to think about, always something we have to think about. You know, some breeds are really outbred. Um, you know, the, the Golden Retriever, for instance, or the, Pointer, or, or the Labrador Retriever, really popular breeds. Um, and others um, um, are re like the Lund Hound in Norway. That is the most inbred breed. It's an outlier in every single analysis we've done. Yeah. Well, so those a, are important In a related way, even though it would be a real challenge to get your phenological data or phenotypes, um, would sequencing mixed breeds, all, a, a huge, yeah. uh, would right. that be more effective? So the problem with mixed breeds is you know, if you if you look at if you look at data where people have done a lot of sequencing in mixed breeds, and and Eleanor Carlson has been uh, doing this at UMass and Amherst for their big behavior project, and so you can identify, you know, with a great panel, you can identify principal breeds, but then you know the last ten or twenty percent, you'll get a report back that just says mixed breed or mutt. Right, because there's so many things that have gone in there, there just isn't the resolution to do that. And that matters, because if one of the things in there um, is something from the breed that has your mutation or has your relevant haplotype, it's a problem. Having said that, we've been criticized for not doing enough with mixed breed dogs. Um, and so um, I have a, a series of slides I sometimes show on mixed breed dogs. I didn't today, but I'd be very happy to share it, because if you know their composition, then they're incredibly useful for cutting down these big regions of linkages equilibrium that characterizes dogs, right? So they become extremely useful for that. But when you get a report back from Embark, one of the lead companies who does this, and it tells you it's this, it's this, and this, and it's 20% mixed breed that we can't identify. Mm, yeah. I'll yeah. sneak in one last quick question. Um, I was wondering, are you or others developing AI tools where you could um, uh, compare, for example, overall morphology, try to find subtle morphological traits that are shared between humans and then point you to a specific species of dog that would yeah. um, cross-match those. So that's a, uh, that's a great question. So we are not. Uh, there may be a couple of labs that have started doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I should ask around and, and see. I think where where we are was was in the space of saying how subtle can you get down to like the the curve of you know of the nose how little can it be where you get a really clean signal and we've surprised ourselves right you know I didn't expect Heidi's data to look so good mm -hmm. um, it's much cleaner and and the signal to noise ratios are much better by and large than I would have expected so now for sure is the time to do that you're absolutely right um, personally I want to go after the 22 kinds of tail. Right, I mean, I think that would just be so cool <laughs> to find the underlying genes responsible for these 22 very carefully and meticulously, I should put that slide in, um, descriptors of tail that the American kennel. And they have the same thing for ears and they have the same thing for paws and number of toes and whether they're webbed or not. And, I mean, you name it and there's a variant of dog that has it. Can I ask a yeah, sure. question? Oh yeah, sure, it's heavy. <laughs> So I was thinking about samples and how you're collecting samples from all over the world. Have you thought about maybe doing a deep dive sequencing in the poops of all these breeds and do a gut microbiome project? Yeah, that's a great question. I get asked that question all the time. Um, are we going to do a microbiome project? And there's a lot of interest in it, and there are people um, who have done it. I think I'm... I'm not going to go there. I think there are, are people 
in microbiome, in the field, who, you know, their expertise, you know, people like Julian out of that lab, whose expertise so far surpasses anything we would have, even if we put a lot of energy into it, because we would be complete novices to the field, that I haven't done that. But we have a, a study in Chernobyl um, where we've been looking for things that have been uh, mutations that have occurred in the germline that have allowed dogs to live and, and breed in that region. And the people in the field have been collecting poop samples, actually, and they keep offering them to us. They keep saying, we could send you some poop. And I keep saying, you know, I should ask Julie if she's interested in those poop samples. But um, there are people who, is who are interested, and it's a very good project. It's a very good idea. But for now, we haven't explored that. And I don't think we will. But it's a good question. All right, thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate your attention.